Hello and welcome to lecture one of the Dev Maths and Stats Refresher course. Now, before we get into the details of the maths that we're going to cover today, I'd just like to start with an example of the way that you'll probably meet uh, mathematical notation in lectures. And I've chosen the example of the dual economy model, which is a model from the famous um, pioneer of development economists, um, Arthur Lewis from the Caribbean, the St. Lucia. And in his model, he said that a way of visualizing development in general is when you have most of the population engaged in agricultural production or other uh, forms of low technology production, such as this in um, near Horsey Mere in Norfolk. And then you get some small areas of, of more capital intensive investment, often in the capital city, such as we have here in um, Nigeria with people working in the um, programming and computer technology sector. And the idea is that you can pay higher wages because it's more productive because of the capital investment. Therefore, you can attract people from the agricultural area. And one of his insights was that you can attract people from the agricultural area without greatly diminishing the agricultural output because there's a great deal of what he called underemployment in the agricultural areas. Uh, and then as people move to the um, more capital intensive production, um, output increases, you can reinvest the output and then attract more people from the agricultural area and then the economy grows. So that was the basic idea of the model. And even though it was published in the 60s and it's been upgraded and criticised and changed, it's still a very influential way of thinking about development now. So we have this typical situation of a dual economy. So suppose you have a developing country where most of the working population are engaged in agriculture and also a small industrial sector. Okay. So here I'm saying that to update this, it could be foreign owned export processing enterprises, such as a special export processing zone, um, such as the ones that uh, the Chinese are now setting up in parts of West and East Africa and other areas. Now, the question here for policy might be, well, you want to encourage the growth of export industries, um, perhaps by liberalizing your trade and, and investing in infrastructure in the, the urban areas, but you're worried about what's going to happen to, to rural living standards where most of the people live as you do this. So one suggestion could be, okay, let's increase tax on this successful modern sector, the trading goods, and use the revenues to assist those farmers who are otherwise are in danger of being left behind. So in a model, in the lecture I might say, well, let's look at the impact of this policy. Well, we assume that part of families' consumption comes from their own farm production and part comes from what they can buy. So we make some further assumptions, which is that harvests tend to increase when there's more support for, from the government for agriculture in these kind of areas. Um, but on the other hand, if there's higher prices for farm pr production, that stimulates production from the farmers. But, sorry, this is on the other hand, higher prices for the goods they're selling stimulates production, but higher prices for the goods they're buying negatively affects what they can buy with the things they sell. Now, a, an obvious criticism of this policy is that increasing the trade tariffs is going to damage the development of that modern industrial sector. And it could also increase the price of manufactured goods for people that are buying them at home. So that's taken a few minutes to read through. And there's a number of different factors. So what we often do in the kind of work that you, the kind of approach you'll see this year is we often try and pull out the different factors and express the problem more clearly using symbols. Yeah. So we're trying to make the, the important factors, the relationships and everything stand up more clearly than they do in this text form. And often the mathematical way that you do this is using what we call functions. So just looking at the agricultural side for now, where most people are working, we'd start by saying, okay, let's say that total agricultural production we call A, and A is equal to this. Let me write it like this with brackets. What this is really a shorthand for is saying that agricultural production depends on these four things. It depends on the agricultural labour force, the price that farmers get for their crops, the price of manufactured goods, and the expenditure by governments, all these things that support agriculture. And the, the jargon here is that the variable A is a function of these four other variables. In other words, A depends on those four other variables. So I've tried to put in these notes the important jargon in, in bold. So function is an important piece of terminology. 
arguments is another argument to these variables inside the function. And this is what the output depends on. So that the inputs into the function are the arguments. Um, a is only a function if, if given any combination of these, any single combination of these four variables gives you just one value for agricultural output, then it's a function. Another term you meet is domain, and domain means the range of possible values that these communities can take. So LA, the agricultural labour force, that can only be positive numbers, and it can only be positive whole numbers. PA again can only be can be all positive numbers. PM can be all positive numbers. G could be zero because the governments might be completely uninterested in rural development. At a stretch, you could even say that. G is negative if the government is somehow extracting resources from the rural area, which some people say does happen. Another thing you might have noticed here in the way I've written this is plus and minus signs. Now, if you have not already done so, just think what the plus and minus signs mean and pause the video for a second, and then I'll give you the answer to what that means. Well, hopefully you've thought about that, and if we open this up, the answer is that the plus and minus shows the direction of the influence on the function. So an increase in the total number of workers should increase output. So above LA is positive, because more workers gives you more output. Um, notice the plus. The plus also could mean that you could also understand this as maybe meaning that A moves in the same direction as, as L. So when L goes up, A goes up. When L goes down, A will go down. Similarly, you should be able to make sense of these. If the price of agricultural goods goes up, then people are motivated to produce more. If the price of manufactured goods goes up, that means that people can buy, farmers can buy less with um, what they're producing. So the usual argument would be that that means that they're less motivated to produce because what they're getting is worth less in terms of what they can buy. So they produce less. But you might possibly uh, have an alternative view. And G means that the more government support you get, the more output there is. That's so positive. Okay, so to continue with this, we can say, well, we're not so much directly interested in agricultural output. We want to look at consumption levels. So how does per capita consumption in the rural areas get affected by th this fact? Well, clearly that's going to depend on, depend on agricultural output. And it also depends on what the rural population is. Now, to keep it simple, I've assumed that the rural population is the same as the agricultural labour force. So you might like to think about how accurate that is. Um, but this means that per capita consumption C would be written like this. So this is, remember, this just means that C depends on agricultural output and the agricultural labour force or rural population. What signs would you put over the two arguments of this function? If you, would you put a plus or a minus here, or a plus or a minus here? So please just pause for a second and think about that if you're not sure. Okay, hopefully you've done that. So above the A, I think that the more agricultural output there would be, you'd think that people would be able to consume more, there's more available, so it'd be a positive. On the other hand, this one here, the more, um, the more people there are, the more that's got to be shared around. So the more people there are that need to, to eat or use that food, so the more people, the more mouths there are to feed, the less there will be per person. So this would be a negative one. Okay, so that's the what's what's happening in the agricultural part, the traditional parts, the traditional parts of the two sectors. Now let's look at the industrial parts, the more modern area. And again, we might have a function like this. We did. Again, the, the, the exact form of how it would depend on the assumptions you make, but one particular way you could do it would be to say that, let's say that manufacturing output depends on these things here. So easy exchange rates, that's the price of manufactured goods again. This is the wage rate for people working in that modern sector. And this is the, the policy variable, the level of taxes on exports. So we're interested in what happens if we start changing this. Again, you should think about the pluses and minuses on here. Um, and you can do that. I'll give you a moment to think if you want to pause it. Okay, well, E, and this is something that 
people, if you're not used to dealing with developing economies, then you have to get used to this, that it's usually written so that E is the number of units of local currency per dollar. So when, for example, so many rupees per, per dollar or so many shillings per dollar or kwacha per dollar. So when E goes up, that actually means the exchange rate is getting weaker against the dollar, it's going down. So if E goes up here, it means the local exchange rate is going down. So your manufactured goods are getting cheaper, so you should be able to export more of them to stimulate, to stimulate output. If the price of manufactured goods, so this would be a positive. Um, this one here, um, if the price of manufactured goods goes up, that would either that could, could stimulate goods or it could mean that they get too expensive. So we can, might put a question mark on that, but let's say it's a plus because it's going to stimulate output. This W quite clearly is going to be negative because the more you have to pay people, that makes your output or your, your production more expensive. That would be negative. And T would also be negative. So if, if your exports get taxed, then that's going to deter um, sales. So that would be negative. OK, so now we've got three equations for agricultural outputs, manufacturing outputs, and per capita consumption. The next bit of jargon here is a model. When you've got a set of equations that cover all the things, the relationships you're interested in, interested in, then you've got a model. Now, one way to take this on, if you want to, to, to confront this with some data, uh, which is what you're going to want to do, especially the impact evaluation people who are very interested in data, um, one way to do this is to attain a reduced form by combining equations together. For example, here, A, as well as being a function itself, appears in this one. Yeah? Because agricultural output depends on a range of things, but then consumption depends on agricultural output. And that means that ultimately, um, consumption depends on A. So you can replace this A with these other factors here, because ultimately A depends on these other factors. So it doesn't need to be appear separately here. So what you can do is replace that A with the other factors that A depends on, so you get this. And I don't, so I don't repeat LA twice because it's already there. It's already listed as something that is dependent. So the, thing, the things in the brackets are just the things which ultimately have an effect on C. OK, it can start to get confusing a lot. So I really encourage you to use what are called channel diagrams. Even if they don't get into your final submitted or published work, they're an excellent way of playing with ideas and understanding what you think is affecting what. So here's a channel diagram for what we have so far. That's a diagram for the first function, showing that A depends on these factors. And the plus is where this thing moves in the same direction. So this goes up, this goes up, it goes down, that goes down. The negative is where it moves in the opposite direction. So that's the first function. Here's the, the C function. So C depends on L, A, and A. And then when we replace it to get this form, we're just replacing this A here by saying that C depends ultimately on all these things. Okay. Now we've got to bring in the modern sector. Um, now M, there's no M in here, unfortunately, so there's no link to the modern sector. But the common link is the price of manufactured goods. So we have the price of manufactured goods is linked to M. So if we have the actual equation, the form of the equation that links pm to m, then under circumstances, certain circumstances, because every value of m is linked to a value of, every value of pm is linked to a value of m, you can rearrange the equation. And we'll do lots of examples of this. Um, so you can rearrange the equation to get this. So if you know these things, then you can work backwards and work out what pm is. Once you've done that, you can do the same trick we've already done and replace the pm in here with the list of things that PM depends on, these things. It's a single function that shows all the ultimate influences on rural per capita consumption. Okay, so I want to give you a couple of seconds to try and do that. So please pause the video, see if you can work out what this would look like, the final, the final equation for C. So this, what does C ultimately depend on? So try and write that down. If you have a bit of time, you can sketch the channel, the full channel diagram. So pause the video, have a go at that. And you should get this. Okay, so you should get something like this for the list of things that C ultimately depends on. 
and you can add to the channel diagram by PM depending on these things here. So now we've got what we want, which is showing how C ultimately depends on all of these things here. So we've removed this because this is determined by something else. We've removed this. So thinking back to the original question, you can now answer this. So what happens if the government does put up taxes on trade? Well, yeah, indeed we'd expect taxes on trade to increase, which means that the price of manufactured output is going to go up. Now, um, as this goes up, this moves in the opposite direction because people are discouraged from agricultural production. So as the price of this goes up, there'll be less agricultural production. And this moves in the same direction as this. Less agricultural production means that rural per capita consumption would indeed go down. So it's confirming the idea that a, a downside to increasing this is that you're ultimately going to decrease rural per capita consumption. So the poor people left in that sector who have already left, been left behind will, will have their, their well-being further affected. Okay, so that's the kind of way you might meet these things in lectures during the year. When you've got a situation and the lecturer, instead of carrying on just discussing it in words, will start discussing it using functions and perhaps channel diagrams and these plus minus signs. You'll often get that without going into the specific mathematical detail that the rest of this lecture is about. Now, before we go into that, you'll come across a lot of criticisms. Um, th there's been a lot of criticism of, of, of the kind of methods we use in, in impact evaluation, in um, uh, economics, and even in sort of mathematical sociology, mathematical political science. So and this is this is little practical use. It's just autistic social science, autistic economics. Um, the real world is not like this. Um, my answer is, yeah, it's true, um, but only if you didn't take it any further than that. So. How useful this comes in is, how, is, is the skill that you use to interpret the results and then apply it to evidence to actual data. All we've done is translated the situation we had before into mathematical form, form so we can then um, analyze it further or confront it with some data, see if it actually matches the facts. Having said that, hopefully there's plenty of discussion or in this online form, there's plenty of thoughts about this. We can have discussion later. What did I include in the functions? What should I, what have I left out? Should it have been a plus or a negative sign? So the, the advantage of going through these steps is as much as what you're left at the end with is that process of going through and turning your discursive text-based description into a mathematical formal description means you have to really look at those assumptions and say, okay, do we have to make some silly assumptions here? Are there some mistakes we've made? Um, when you put it into formal notation, there's nowhere to hide. You've got to be really clear. Uh, and if the disadvantage we have is that when we make some stupid assumptions or silly mistakes, the rest of the world can see it and laugh at us. But really, that's a strength. When you go to something which is which is in disciplines where people do not use any maths, it could be that what they're saying is also completely full of crazy assumptions and, and, and stupid simplifications. But because they're not putting it into formal, into verbal, into mathematical form, they can sneak those things through and nobody notices them. Okay, and there's some ideas about how you can take it further. So those are things we can discuss if you like. Some examples of further things you can add if you want to take the analysis further. Okay, so much of the course then will be about, um, much of the course, the, the master's courses are about um, using this kind of notation, even if you don't go further, but then when you want to start doing further analysis and using data, then you have to get further into the detail of what precise functions we're using. So much of this course would be about looking at the exact kind of functions we're using. And then in the second part of the course, how to um, start looking at the way these match up with data. So in the rest of today's lecture, we'll look at some different kinds of functions. Okay, that's all for this part one, but thanks for watching.